This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Hi, all. I'm Rob Telson, Vice President of Ecosystem and Partnerships at BrainChip. Welcome and thank you for joining our latest episode of our BrainChip podcast series. These events are structured to provide current and future investors and those interested in AI and the BrainChip technology a path to better understand who we are, what we are doing, and where we are going. If you've not listened to any of our podcasts, please go to our website at www.brainchip.com and visit our media tab and select podcasts. You can also listen to any of these podcasts on your favorite podcast platform, or please go to our YouTube channel at BrainChip Inc. and find all of our podcasts and additional media. Today, we have a very special podcast. See, we're going to do this where I'm going to be a moderator, and we have Keith Wittick joining us from Tenstorrent. Keith, welcome. Thank you, Rob. It's great to be on your program. Looking forward to the discussion today. Yeah, just a little bit about Keith. Keith is currently the COO of Tenstorrent. He's leading the operations, the legal, the HR, finance, facilities, compliance, licensing, and other functions. And the great thing about, great thing about that is prior to joining Tenstorrent, Keith led all aspects of strategic alliances for Google's consumer electronics programs. And that encompassed Pixel, G-Chips, Fitbit, Nest, and a ton of other technologies. And prior to that, Keith worked at Sci-Fi, where he was the Senior Vice President of Corporate Development and General Counsel, structuring innovative industry partnerships and global business models for the adoption of RISC-V technology. And before joining Sci-Fi, Keith was the Director of Technology Enablement and Associate General Counsel at Tesla. That's right, the driving automotive environment for R&D technology and development and deployment of the Tesla Model 3 and other technologies. And prior to that, Keith spent 13 years at AMD, where uh, his last role was Corporate VP of Strategy and Corporate Development. Beyond all of these phenomenal experiences that Keith's had in industry, Keith has a passion for entrepreneurship and sits on the board of Starting Block Madison, which helps entrepreneurs build innovative companies in the Midwest and turn their ideas into real businesses. And what makes this even more exciting is joining Keith today is Nandan Nyampoli, our Chief Marketing Officer at BrainChip. Nandan, welcome. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me as well. Yeah, so this is going to be a, a phenomenal podcast because as I just mentioned, the experience, experiences that Keith has had in the industry from all different avenues really align well with how we're driving AI um, today and for the future. And what makes this extremely unique is BrainChip being an edge AI environment and focused on really the true edge and, and smart, intelligent devices uh, in, in the IoT world um, is driving in an area very similar to what Tenstorrent's doing, but Tenstorrent's doing it from the other side. They're looking at the data center and they're looking at um, driving intelligence from a different environment. So together you have two hard charging companies, both driving the world of AI from different perspectives. So between Nan and Keith, this discussion is gonna be phenomenal. I'm really, really excited about it. So guys, again, thank you for joining. And with that, I'm a little bit caffeinated. So we're gonna dive into this gentlemen and go from there. So let's start with this. Keith, why don't you tell us a little bit about Tenstorrent, um, a little bit about yourself and, and let's get started. Yeah, thanks Rob. So you did a, a really good job uh, introducing me. I don't think there's anything more I could possibly say that you haven't already said. So thank you very much for that intro. Um, so talk a little bit about TENS Torrent. So we're all experiencing the AI revolution. I guess this is the fourth kind of big hype cycle we're experiencing in AI. And I honestly believe, and Nandan probably does too, this hype cycle is going to stick. This, like the internet bubble that happened in 2000 to 2002 is going to change everything from this day forward integrate AI into a lot of our different verticals and businesses and market segments. And we'll look back in five years and wonder, you know, how did we get by without AI being all over the place? And it's all over the place right now as we speak, actually. 
So Tenstorin is an AI risk five and systems company with chiplets and uh, rack mounted units that we put into the data center. As you mentioned, we focus on very, very high performance uh, products, intellectual property technology and systems. So our risk five processor, eight way out of order cores down to two way out of order cores. For those of you that know ARM, you could say, oh, it's about an A72 through A78 level of performance all the way up to Zen 4, Zen 5, if you're talking AMD speak or Cortex X4, X5, if you're talking ARM speak. So very, very high performance RISC V cores that we're developing. We're in AI with uh, three chips that'll be in market uh, this year, more to come. And again, high performance AI, largely for the data center, but we can scale our technology from milliwatt to megawatt. So we announced on May 30th, partnership with LG. That is a partnership where we're looking at incorporating our technology into TVs and automotive and very low, low cost or cost sensitive applications that are very cost and power and die size sensitive. So we think we can scale down to some small devices. And basically, one of the things that we're pioneering, which we will talk about later, is the software stack. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this and I'll give the floor back to you, Rob and, and Nandan. But in, somebody told me an interesting story uh, or an interesting kind of analogy. They said, when people write software today, when like Borland or Symantec or Adobe write software for x86 processors, or ARM processors. They don't send that code over to Intel or to ARM and say, throw 30 engineers on this, optimize the code for six months, then give it back to me and hopefully I can run it and people can use it. We have progressed in the CPU world to a point where compilers work, operating systems work. We can all write code. We can run it a second after we, we've compiled it and it works pretty, pretty well. We aren't there in the AI world. So I think the big challenge going forward for AI, and maybe you're also experiencing this at BrainShip, is the hardware, and I know hardware guys are going to hate me for this, but the hardware is not as complicated to build by comparison to things we've done in the past. We know how to do it. We have done it. I did it at Tesla. In 18 months, Jim Keller, Elon, and I had hardware, new hardware, started from scratch, driving a car. The hardware is not the, the, the hard part. We have all the hardware in the car right now to autonomously drive cars. The software isn't there yet, and it probably won't be there for 10 years. And this is the problem is that it's we don't have the software yet to fully optimize all these workloads down to a common architecture. It's going to be a huge challenge. One of the things I'm super excited about and I'm super happy to be a part of here at Tens Torrent and BrainChip, I'm sure, is doing similar stuff. But whoever cracks that world of getting software that people can run, normal, ordinary mortals can run and get AI to run anywhere, that's going to be something that really opens up the floodgates for adoption of AI in a lot of different places. And we're not there yet, but we hope to be there soon. I'll stop yeah, there. No, that, that was great. And and I know Nandan is 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 excited to, to, to jump in here because these are some of the things that uh, BrainChip's looking at as well. And so Nandan, uh, uh, why don't you uh, use this opportunity to to kind of build on what Keith's talking about, but from BrainChip's perspective and what we're seeing and what we're experiencing, what we're doing uh, uh, kind of down the same level. Okay. So I think uh, Keith, that is an excellent kind of uh, intro and, and actually a, a great description of the, the landscape, if you will, right? Um, we've, we've both been through uh, the CPU wars and or CPU uh, becoming uh, prolific GPUs went the same way. And AI, you kind of hit the nail on the head. You can always design great hardware, but if it isn't easy to use, it's not going to get used, right? So it's very clear that you have to focus on not, not just the hardware, not just IP. It has to be the software stack as well, the tooling, the, uh, the environments that make this possible. So in general, what we want to do is build efficient solutions, which is what BrainChip uh, has been focusing on, but also may, make them easy to integrate, work closely with um, ecosystem providers. As you said, in, in, in older days, it was uh, uh, the higher end enterprise stacks, but now it's application stacks. 
And uh, we are working with exactly that to build out an ecosystem just as you are uh, with TensTorrent uh, from different angles. Um, as you said, right, you have a very scalable architecture. Um, in fact, you demonstrated not just the, the cloud side, the data center side, but the fact you get to the edge. And the edge is a pretty vast landscape as well, for all the way from sensors where are nanowatts <coughs> or even microwatts up to um, you know the gateway uh, or the edge box, as you call it, which could be uh, in, in tens or potentially sometimes hundreds of watts, especially if you're looking at something that's running full time in a car. So I think the space is pretty vast and there is actually a need for um, efficient solutions of all kinds to hit all types of use cases and environments. And this is really where uh, I think our story comes together is that AI is not about just the cloud. Um, it's about uh, it having the ability to run AI applications, AI software, um, AI uh, services everywhere, right? You need to connect the edge and the sensor all the way to the cloud and make it efficient. You could always have services that are done from the cloud, but as I think we've seen, the cost can get prohibitive, so you have to be smart about it. And the more you kind of move across and distribute it, it allows the entire industry to grow and scale. So I think that's a, a great start. I'll hand you back to Rob. Yeah, this is great, guys. Thank you. And when I I, I, I listened to both of you talk and, and uh, we continue this discussion, one of the things that our, our listeners love to understand um, is our vision and individual visions and what we see as we look forward and outward uh, with AI. And so we talk a lot about how the technology and how we evolve it, how it's gonna impact us not only today, but in the future. And so uh, Keith, think about a couple of different areas in which you, when you think about AI um, and what you guys are doing um, and other companies such as Brainship, but, but how do you how do you feel? What do you see it uh, from a visionary standpoint? How it's going to impact us in the future? Yeah, that is a very very important and somewhat like loaded question. There's a lot we can talk about here. And I, Rob, I think I'll put that into the con a context that most people can relate to because when you talk just about AI, people's eyes can glaze over and they don't start getting engaged with the conversation. And if you talk about specifics and areas that they're not hitting every day in their daily lives, like a data center. Uh, sometimes it doesn't resonate what you're talking about. So let's talk about automobiles. You know, I was at Tesla. I know both of you were at ARM in the past and heavily focused on the auto industry. So it's probably an area we can talk about. And talking about how AI impacts you getting up in the morning and driving in your car and the whole ecosystem, including other industries that are around automotive, how are they going to be impacted and change because AI is now in the picture. It is way more profound and bigger than most people think. And let's talk about the number one important thing for all of us, or at least it should be the most important thing for all of us when we're talking about cars is safety. I was shocked when I went to work at Intel, at, not Intel, at Tesla. I was shocked to find out 1.4 million people die in cars every year. About 45,000 alone in the US. That's just people who die. Not people whose lives are changed. You know, they've had permanent, you know, medical issues because of a car accident. All of us, everybody watching this show, knows somebody who's been in a car accident and probably been affected by it. Uh, my own daughter uh, rolled a car uh, four times on a highway, and luckily, I got a call in China. I was in China and got a call in the middle of the night. My wife said, "Daughter's in a car accident." We knew nothing. And information's coming in piecemeal from emergency services and everything. She turned out to be fine, no major injuries, but that could have gone very different, right? And the whole thing about AI is when I was listening to a lot of the Tesla engineers who are brilliant talking about this, they said, look, 94% of auto accidents are human error. If you can get a computer in the car that can respond in milliseconds, not a half a second, 
right, is never a drunk driver, always sees things around them with a lot more clarity than we do, interprets situations better, is able to perform physics calculations to determine where to place that car, because sometimes our instincts in the spur of the moment aren't very accurate nor helpful. They said, we can probably take the fatalities in cars from 1.4 million down to 100,000. There's some accidents you can't avoid, you know, a, a tire goes out or something or something falls into the road or radar and cameras can't pick up something because it's obscured in like downtown New York where there's a lot of buildings or something. Some of these accidents can't be prevented, but if a lot of them can be prevented, um, boy, saving a million lives a year is a certainly a, a profound and positive thing that artificial intelligence can do for all of us as we experience our daily lives in, in automobiles. So I'll stop there. Do you guys have any, any comments on that? I don't know if you have something to say about that. No, I think, uh, I think you've hit on a, a very important point, right? So uh, part of AI, right? And most, most of uh, any kind of computation uh, that we have is to try and reduce human error. Right. Initially, statistical, mathematical, uh, it was, again, taking out human error by uh, very repetitively, mechanically effectively doing stuff. AI kind of takes that next step um, forward. And I think what it does beyond uh, just the statistical aspects of it is actually there's a learning aspect of it as it improves with data. Right? And, and I do think that this is uh, critically important for us to move forward. Now, the the one thing I would say is how you do it efficiently is becoming the real challenge. And the fact that it can help and will help is not the question. The question is how do you make it efficient? For example, I think the amount of data being generated, if you have a, all the sensors on a car, is skyrocketing, right? It's it terabytes of data per day. How do you actually process it, store it efficiently without it blowing up on you? in terms of cost, in terms of computation, in terms of service. And that's actually where uh, companies like ours are focusing on improving that capability. You have to make it more efficient. You have to make it uh, learn with less data, store less data, be actually secure with data, be private with data, um, and do it in a way that uh, you actually have a real growth in the service, make it simpler, make it easier to proliferate. Um, so I think completely agree with that. I was going to actually throw one back at you as well in terms of, I know you have experience in this, uh, in terms of health. Right? Uh, one of the statistics that really uh, stood out for me is the CDC's view that um, the amount of productivity lost per year due to preventable chronic diseases is about $1.1 trillion in the US, not counting what it takes to fix it and the healthcare costs are spiraling, but simple things that you could do in terms of personal management, uh, if you had the right uh, intelligence, the right service uh, and right sensors close to you would make that substantially better. And again, I have plenty of, uh, um, experience both personally and through uh, close friends of people that have said, if I'd known this a little bit earlier, I could have done something about it. Right? And now here comes in the, the real benefit of AI, which is today still healthcare models are statistical and you're kind of fitting within ranges. Um, and that doesn't fully take into account what each person does. For example, right? Um, my wife's uh, uh, BP is a certain range, and we've had that problem. That's why I say it. I'm not going to say the numbers, but it, it is actually at the lower end of what is considered uh, the common range. So when she actually has a higher blood pressure, it doesn't register because it's for most uh, first timers that this is actually high for her. It may be in the normal range, but it's high for her. This is actually where the personalization of AI, the personalization of this comes in handy. And that's actually where we've been focusing a lot on how do we actually get not just training in the cloud, for example, which has been the case, down to learning at, at the sensor, 
at the individual to truly personalize that service. And I think that really is the strength of what AI can bring to the individual. So let me hand it back to you, uh, Keith. I'm sure you have views on that. Oh, that is a super broad area to talk about. I, the way I kind of interpret what you were just saying is when you look at what like BrainChip is doing with a lot of sensor fusion type things happening at the edge, there's just mountains of data being collected literally every second and being sent into data centers to process. So I have, you know, I have a degree in computer science, electrical engineering. I've worked as a businessman, uh, businessman. I've, I've got a law degree and I want to get an MBA, but my wife said, if you get another degree, you're going to do that with your second wife. So I think I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I try to put all these things together to see what that means for the industry. And we always talk about what AI does or what quantum computing is going to do or what open source software can do for the planet. We rarely put all these together with multiple experts and have a cohesive conversation about the market. And I tell you, what you're talking about is putting sensor fusion and data collection together with big data, together with artificial intelligence, and then mobility platforms that we can wear when you talk about medical or automobiles driving on the road. What does that mean for our life? And just giving you a quick example from the car industry, and then I'll, I'll get us over to the, the medical industry and talk a little bit about that is, or the healthcare industry, is a simple example in a car. I was born and raised in Wisconsin. I drove in a lot of terrible weather. You can have a situation now in a Tesla or any well-connected car that has really good sensors on it, excellent global positioning. We have all that technology today. If a car takes an off-ramp and hits an icy patch of road, and almost wipes out, uh, that information can be immediately communicated to a data center, AI, and other you know, computer programs can take over and say, okay, we're gonna notify all the cars that are on the road right now that if they exit I-94 at Highway 20, that it's icy right now, they should take that corner or that exit or off ramp at 20 miles per hour, not the post at 40 or whatever, and save lives. I mean, I, growing up in Texas, People here don't uh, are not growing up in Texas, living in Texas now uh, after I moved down here from Wisconsin. We don't drive well in inclement weather. There's a bunch of pickup trucks smashed at the bottom of most of these off, off ramps and icy weather. And so having that kind of digital twin or real time feedback in uh, the data centers, communicating directly to us, making our lives safer, better, more enjoyable, more efficient is going to be profound. And it requires the integration of a lot of domains of expertise, technology, new business models, what I call business engineering. Business engineering and technology engineering has to come together to make this stuff possible. And it's happening around us every day across a lot of big companies. You talked about healthcare. I had an interesting conversation with a professor, a PhD of uh, biosciences in one of the universities in Israel that's... Uh, fantastic. I, I forget the name uh, of the university that was in Israel when I was visiting there, but he said, look, Keith, heart attacks is can be 90% preventable and, and treatable. If we can get a device on people's arms, we can detect things. He talked about something like CEC cells or other technology that or other markers that are in the body that even 72 hours, 48 hours before you have physical symptoms of a heart attack, your body is already giving off chemical signals inside your body that, hey, things aren't right with you and you probably should go see the doctor. We don't go see the doctor because we don't know that's happening. There's no device to indicate that our bodies are approaching some critical point in terms of our health, but it can be detected if we can get, you know, Apple devices or other devices onto our arm or contact lenses in our eye or a patch on our shoulder or people are talking implantables. There's a whole array and assortment of devices that aren't with the right technology that both of our companies are developing right now. It should be able to detect day one, zero day when you, you get cancer. Are you going to have a heart attack in the next 48 hours? Please go see the doctor, right? I, I think there's really profound things that can be done in the healthcare space to make healthcare much more preventative and proactive as opposed to, you know, reactive and just treating the disease after we have it. 
And I would like real time feedback on how I'm doing in terms of are you stressed? Are you exercising enough? Did you eat well today? I think we're probably about five years out from having a lot of that feedback on our wrist, going straight to the ones we love and to our doctors on a daily basis, processed across all of us by big data. So we know the distribution in the country that, hey, you know, we know it now, but we'll put data to it. We're not eating well. Here's what we need to do to make ourselves collectively as a population more healthy. I think it's going to be interesting times in all these industries, retail, manufacturing, health care, tech, financial institutions. I think AI is going to profoundly impact all of those verticals. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree, Keith. And, and I, I know Nanny does as well. And, and between the three of us, we're experiencing these discussions on a daily basis uh, from all different avenues. And, and the one we get most excited about is, is healthcare because we, we truly see it as, as an area where it's going to be extremely beneficial, impact all of our lives and, and allow us to, to, to live better lives moving forward uh, from that end. And, but, you, but you hit the nail on the head. There are so many different environments in which we're moving forward on all fronts um, where our technologies are really going to make a, a positive impact. I think the unique thing about both companies um, is that we're both developing silicon uh, to demonstrate our technology, provide our technology, and we're also in, in the space of, of delivering IP uh, and enabling our technologies to be designed into broader environments, uh, again, to do what we just talked about and making things better for, for all of us. Um, and that leads to a dynamic on delivery mechanisms and how we go about doing things. So let's talk a little bit about Tenstorrent and how you guys are going about doing that uh, for, from a delivery standpoint and what you see moving forward as well. Yeah, there's a couple things to talk about there. So the channels to market and, and Nanda and, and, and Rob, I do want to get your point of view here. In terms of channels to market, we're seeing so many different avenues that customers want to bring the value of AI or high performance compute to the market, to their products and services in the verticals they're in. We have customers, I'll start from from the front end of the design supply chain where IP licensing, we have a lot of companies saying, just give me some soft or hard IP. I have at the customer capable engineers. I can integrate this into the product. I can build complicated devices without your help. Just give me IP. I'll do everything from there. Thank you very much. We'll go to market. And we have to support that. You then have other channels to market with other customer bases that are saying, well, I need help pulling together the SOCs. So can you give me some chiplets, which is probably something we should talk about, actually. I think it's going to profoundly change not only the semiconductor business and create new winners and losers in that market, but I think it's going to profoundly change the types of verticals that we're all servicing right now. Their ability to actually enter the deep semiconductor and electronic development business for themselves. What Apple has done as a vertical developing silicon, I think is going to be much more easier, much easier for people to do in the future. So companies that are on the periphery like Cisco or Pfizer or Ford, um, even places like Walmart can start thinking about, well, I have electrical systems that help me run my business. I do a lot of data compute and data collection. I need certain devices that I may not be getting off the shelf from companies like NVIDIA or Intel or Qualcomm. So maybe I build it myself. Well, chiplets, putting together these systems like Legos is something that perhaps we should talk about. And then we ship old fashioned SOCs. We put boards together through the supply chain, usually in in Mexico or, or Asia. We do systems, we have a for you, a compute box called Galaxy that we can put in the data centers to do AI acceleration and processing. It's just basically a full graph core, graph-based computer that can run AI in a really flexible way. So yeah, the the supply chain and how we channel this to market and through what business models we get this to market is highly diverse. And I enjoy it. Uh, I'm, I'm like a kid in the candy store with this stuff using my law degree, engineering degrees and business uh, background every day. But what, what are you guys experiencing? And specifically, are you seeing chiplets as as a real game changer in the industry? Uh, so uh, I'm actually going to take this discussion back and hark it to the, uh, uh, the growth of the industry as well. Right. So I think you started this conversation by talking about the Internet in uh, 95 to 2000. Right. So it had a huge promise. 
And uh, we were still stuck in dial-up in 95. And naturally, the, the promise uh, was really to be delivered on broadband. So it took time to get there. And the, the time you mentioned, 2000 to 2002, uh, was most had most of it along the way, but hadn't quite exploded. But what you saw when things started exploding is that the devices that were connected to the internet started uh, getting um, interesting as well and needed to be more competitive, compelling, computationally capable. And you started seeing ASICs um, and SOCs being developed for different types of applications that weren't so common before. And you started the entire semiconductor industry go. IP for lots of things became much more uh, relevant. If you look at uh, the, the latter half of the decade, uh, IoT, which is like combining compute with sensor um, and uh, effectively connectivity uh, came about, you got, again, a, a huge amount of uh, growth in that space. So if you look at AI today, I think AI is somewhere around the 2002 of internet, right? So there's a lot, a lot to go. Of course, it'll move faster. It's moving a lot faster because a lot of that infrastructure to design, to develop, to scale has been there. But as you say, the paradigms will shift. I remember talking about chiplets in 2008, right? And it, at that point, it was a gleam in somebody's eye and said, it'll happen. It took nearly a decade for it to come right. But now I think depending on the market, depending on the economics of it, chiplets are relevant to a lot of markets. I mean, companies like AMD, Intel, uh, and they have done amazing things with it in their standard roadmaps. You guys are actually working with it. I see a lot more smaller and startup companies uh, going to the chiplet model for the higher end, right? Because there's an economic aspect to it. So chiplets, I think, are here to stay depending on the marketplace. As they democratize in terms of cost, they may move into others. I think it becomes a very interesting deployment model that takes uh, some of the costs, some of the risk, and uh, kind of the inventory aspects of it out. Also, the specialization and domain capabilities uh, where they belong, which is companies like yourselves or ours that know what the subsystems are that they're building to help integrate into a larger solution. Right. So I do think that uh, chiplets will be a player uh, in the marketplace. IP still continues because a lot of the existing silicon providers also want to integrate best-in-class solutions, whether it's AI, ML, CPU, GPU, into the, the rest of the things they provide, whether it be sensor, whether it be uh, connectivity, uh, whether it's uh, communications, uh, networking, um, acceleration, et cetera. So I think IP continues. And this is... One of the challenges of uh, smaller companies in AI uh, is that we have to actually present not just IP, not just silicon, but in, an array of things that people can take to market with our technology. And so BrainChip kind of did our silicon first to demonstrate it, but also as a platform for development, platform for a small um, uh, you know, small volume production, prototyping, et cetera. We've kind of gone with the board approach for that. We've gone with the chip approach for people that can actually take those things to market. And then of course there's IP for true scaling. Um, so yes, I think overall IP is uh, a strong play and chiplets are becoming strong plays in um, different types of the market. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh not much more than I can add because we've we've hit on all fronts. But I think based off of what we've talked about, what we're experiencing, that there's a variety of different avenues in which we're proliferating our technology. And really, we're at this point where we're enabling and enabling and enabling, knowing that at the end of the day, we want to drive the, the technology into these devices um, from a broader scale. And, and IP allows us to do that. Yeah, and I think, you know, one last comment on that to tie it together, uh, Rob and Nandan. I mean, what you are saying is absolutely 100% true, and I'll, I'll take it to a, a different level, which is, again, it's, it's solving and enabling and allowing people to experiment at a level they've never done before. That by itself is good, but then it's solving a lot of problems, and it's, it's reducing cost, and it's much more accessible for people to use. So Moore's Law is slowing. It's very clear that we're, we're paying 
and it's getting more expensive. We're paying more and more money every generation for our new integration and technology platform that we're developing. The Moore, Moore's Law doesn't give us the same power performance and area for every dollar we're investing. The investment dollars are going through the roof. I remember when it, when it was super eye-popping to spend $40 million for a lithography machine in a semiconductor fab. Now we're approaching $400 million, not $40 million, $400 million for one machine. It's got less power and sometimes less throughput than the machines we were buying you know, 10 years ago for $40 million. So time to market is poor. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, you know, when, when AMD bought ATI, um, there's, so, there's 250 people working big deals like this. And I was, you know, front and center on this deal. And you miss things. You miss things in these deals. And one of the things, surprisingly, that we missed was that graphics chips were done in bulk silicon. And our CPU chips at the time were done in SOI silicon to get the leakage and the thermals down. And mixing those two technologies couldn't be done. Right. You couldn't do it on the same substrate with the same manufacturing flow. If we had chiplets back in that late 2000s, we could have put these two pieces of technology together in three to six months. It would have been fine. You know, two die, lay them down, package them, go to market, new test bench, finished. It took us three to five years to fix that because we had to redesign these two devices to go on the same monolithic substrate. So time to market is faster. Derivatives are faster. Experimentation is faster. We can put optics and power electronics and silicon all together in the same package. Form factor goes down. We talked earlier about the wearables, the implantables for the medical industry. How do you do that if you have something the size of a graphics card? It's not going to get embedded next to your liver, right? This is just not going to happen. So I think when you see a technology like chiplets that is offering so much and solving so many problems, there's going to be winners and losers in the market. So there's going to be some people that don't want to see it happen and will resist it. But with that much benefit, it is going to happen. And it is going to change the winners and losers in the semiconductor market. And it's going to enable companies who aren't semiconductor companies to start thinking and acting and adding benefit for the business as if they were making their own semiconductors with the right partnerships. I think that is going to be huge for the industry. I think it'll take us into a new era just by itself. Just chiplets by itself could do that. And I think we'll see it in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, this has been, a, this is, this has been a great podcast and there's so much more that we can talk about, but we've been, we've been going on for a while. And um, I traditionally close our podcast with this tricky question that I have, but, and it's about superheroes. I'm not going to do that today. We're going somewhere better because there are a lot of people that are going to watch this podcast and say, one, Keith, you have a lot of guitars behind you. And one of them is your favorite, but most importantly, um, what Nanda and I need to understand as well as our, as well as our listeners, if you were to grab one of those guitars today and play one song with it, what song would it be? Whoa. All right. I would play, can I say, I'll say one of two songs. Uh, I would probably play like crazy train from Ozzy Osbourne because Randy Rhodes was a guitar player when I was young that influenced me probably most profoundly or I would play a Van Halen song, maybe the tapping part of Eruption for you. You know, Eddie Van Halen passed away a couple of years ago. He was also a super huge uh, influence on not only me, but probably millions of people who took up playing guitar. He just changed the, the instrument. So, yeah, I would play either a Van Halen song for you, probably Eruption, or I'd play Crazy Train from uh, Ozzy. OK, well, that's good. And, and I think that our listeners are probably saying, OK, Rob Nandon, here's your shot. What would you play? I know what I would play. So, man, if, if you could grab one of Keith's guitars and start jamming with them, what would you play? Well, I wouldn't grab Keith's guitar. It's I'm not I'm not an electric guy. I do acoustic. You can see my fingers. I pick. <laughs> uh, so mine would be um, actually the other end of the spectrum. So after they've gone through Keith's like very, very powerful uh, slashy activity, they'd go into the corner and relax with me finger picking on here comes the sun <laughs> in the accused. Nice. Okay. Well, this is good. Cause I'm divergent. I was looking at this going, okay, would I go a little bit of Van Morrison and just sit here and just jam away or would I go ACDC? So I could, I could go with both you guys. How about that? So, um, but most importantly, I think uh, we should have a jam session 
And because you guys are both Texans and I love barbecue, we should do barbecue and jamming together and we could have fun doing that. That sounds good to me. How about you guys? Sounds like a plan. Absolutely. Black's barbecue and Black Sabbath. Let's do it. (laughs) Oh, you're on. So, uh, no, this has been fantastic. Keith, we, on behalf of Brain Chip, Nan and myself, we want to thank you very much for, for joining us on this podcast. And um, we might be doing this again because there's a lot that we didn't get to. Um, but the, 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 the thing we want to get across to everyone is that uh, this is an exciting time, but it's, it's more than that. It's that we're moving on all fronts, this revolution, as, as you called it earlier, the AI revolution and intelligent devices and intelligent devices are gonna, are gonna span the spectrum from a very low end and devices in which you want this battery power to last for, for six months at a time. And this is an area where brain chips gonna thrive all the way up to the higher end of the compute where Tenstorin is gonna play an impactful role. And together our technologies are really going to make a positive impact. So um, this is, has been great guys, thank you. And on behalf of of everyone we appreciate your time we look forward to our next podcast taking place and um thank you for joining us today well thanks keith on my from my side as well personally i appreciate you coming on board and really enjoyed the discussion oh it was it was awesome it's amazing how fast you know 30 to 45 minutes whatever it was could go by there's so much to talk about here that's just i think interesting and amazing but i think we hit i think we'll get people thinking about it hit some top points but gosh there's so much depth here thank you all thanks for listening to the brain chip podcast please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform